So today we're going to talk about shoulder instability and the tests that we can use to define it and differentiate which direction. We know that the shoulder is the most mobile joint in the body and sometimes that mobility crosses the line into instability. That contributes to the problems that you and I see like rotator cuff pathology or glenohumeral degeneration. So first let's understand what creates stability. Number one, bony stability comes from the shallow glenoid and it is very shallow with a big round humeral head. So that alone provides minimal stability. That's enhanced a little bit by the glenoid labrum. That's a fibrocartilage ring that wraps around the glenoid and it serves to hold the, the humeral head in place a little better. It deepens that by about five or 10 millimeters and provides 50% of the cavity depth of that glenohumeral joint. So that helps. And those two bones are held together by a capsule, which help, but not a lot because the capsule is not a good stabilizer and its ability to stabilize further decreases with age. So we have some ligaments, which are actually just thickenings of the capsule. As you can see on this image, we have the superior glenohumeral ligament. We have the middle glenohumeral ligament. And then we have the inferior glenohumeral ligament where you can see the anterior band. There's also an axillary pouch underneath and a posterior band of that inferior glenohumeral ligament on the backside. And finally, the spiral ligament. So what goes wrong with these things? Number one, it could be a structural problem like trauma on a fall on an outstretched arm or hand creating a dislocation. Or it could be functional, more of a micro trauma over a long period of time from posture or muscle imbalances. That's going to lead for a couple of different problems. Number one, traumatic onsets typically affect the anterior capsule, whereas atraumatic onsets or the microtrauma, posture and functional types of problems generally affect the posterior capsule, providing posterior instability or subluxation in that direction. This is really common and this is what you and I see much more often in overhead laborers, overhead athletes, whether they be throwers or somebody who swims or plays tennis, anybody who's bringing their arm up a whole lot. And when they get instability, the symptoms range the spectrum from unnoticeable to debilitating, especially debilitating if it's anterior. Posterior is usually a little bit more subtle, but we see discomfort or clunking or loss of function, especially when the patient's using their arm, so it's episodic. Sometimes we could even feel or, or sense that subluxation or even dislocation if it's really loose. So how do we assess this? Number one, we'll palpate. So we'll palpate both the anterior and the posterior aspect of the joint. If there's an anterior instability, usually there's corresponding tenderness on that side and the same for posterior on the back side. Number two is we'll look at that patient and say, is there any bulging or prominence of the humeral head, especially as they move through a range of motion? And if that patient has some bulging posterior or anterior when we're moving them, then we can know that there could be some instability in that phase. The other clinical pearl that we can look at is if there's a skin dimple on the posterior deltoid, that's often indicative of posterior shoulder instability, which may be present in up to 60% of those cases. The other thing that we wanna assess are the muscles. We know that the rotator cuff generates torque, but it also generates stability because it depresses and retracts the humeral head into that shallow glenoid. So the way that we can assess that is through the dynamic rotary stability test. We have that patient move into a mid cocking phase and then go ahead and throw and we're going to do this isometrically and then concentrically and eccentrically in a couple of different positions throughout that throwing plane. And as she's contracting, I'm, I'm trying to, to sense, is there any subluxation of that joint anterior posterior, especially in a, a posterior direction? Now, the tests that we'll use for specific anterior versus posterior fit into a couple of groups. Let's do the anterior first. So lie on your back. We're all familiar with the most classic test, and that's the apprehension test. Moving that patient's arm into external rotation, and then we could apply just a little bit of overpressure there as well. Patients who have a look of apprehension on their face, that's positive for anterior instability. So the other two maneuvers that we do to clarify that are number one, the Job relocation test. I'll simply apply a posterior force through the shoulder and somebody who has instability, the symptoms go away. They feel better when I help them relocate their shoulder into the right position. So we do apprehension, Job relocation, and then the final phase of that is the surprise release, which as it sounds, we quickly release in a surprise fashion that force. And if the patient has a redevelopment of discomfort, now we're pretty certain that the combination of those three tests suggests anterior shoulder instability. One other test that we can use for that is the load and shift test. So the load and shift test is simply stabilizing the patient's shoulder and then taking their, their glenohumeral joint in a posterior lateral direction, 
and then an anterior medial direction. So I'm just shearing that. I'm loading and shifting it back and forth in this diagonal plane here. If we feel excessive motion on one side versus the other, it's suggestive of instability in the corresponding direction. Number two we can do is the Kim test. So the Kim test, we have the patient's arm abducted, elbow bent at 90 degrees, and we are going to then create a, uh, a pushing on the elbow, so an axial compression at the elbow, while I'm pulling posterior on the glenohumeral joint and moving that patient through a range of motion. And if I can feel that there's some subluxation posterior or a sense of apprehension or pain on the patient's face, then the Kim test is positive. The other test for posterior instability we can do again in a supine fashion, and they're all fairly similar. Number one, posterior apprehension test. So we're going to have that patient take their arm into a Hawk and Kennedy type position, and I'm going to shear their arm posterior. If I feel some uh, excessive movement or discomfort, that's a positive test. The next one we can do is the push-pull test. So the push-pull test works by simply pushing on the glenohumeral joint while I'm pulling on the elbow. Again, shearing that joint in a posterior, posterior fashion. And finally, the posterior drawer test, where I'll have the patient move into kind of a self-choke position, and then I'm going to, again, axially compress through the arm and feel does that, does that joint shear in a posterior fashion. So all those tests, trying to do the same thing, applying a pressure, moving the glenohumeral joint in one direction or the other. And then finally, for inferior instability, which would be a little less common, simply putting my finger on the acromioclavicular joint I'm sorry, out, out at the end, just in the subacromial space, and then distracting in an inter inferior fashion. And if I feel that open up, that's a positive sulcus test. So I hope those tests are useful. The other thing that we don't want to forget are the functional diagnoses of scapular dyskinesis or upper cross syndrome. When a patient has that, they're much more likely to suffer, especially from a posterior instability. I hope that these tests are helpful. If you want to review any of them, you can check the corresponding blog or log into Cairo up. You'll see the tests and more importantly, the treatments on how to solve these problems. Thanks for watching.